All right, I think it's about time to, to get started. Uh, so welcome everyone. Today, we are very happy to have Nafis telling us about 4D transcendence and a strange point of view uh, on the beta gauge correspondence. All right, take it away. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, so I would like to thank the um, seminar organizers for giving me the chance to talk about my work. Um, so I'll be talking about an ongoing project where I'm working with um, Farooq Mosavian, Surya Raghavendran, and Juna Yagi. And the work is about um, a string of perspective on the beta gauge correspondence, and in particular, its relation to 4 d and Simon theory. Um, here, <clears throat> uh, the beta side will correspond to a GLM and spin chain, and uh, the gauge side will correspond to a 2D n equals 2 comma 2 theory. So let me start by setting up the elements of the correspondence. So um, the beta gauge correspondence is a remarkable result uh, relating to apparently distinct things. So on one side, we have uh, spin chains, integrable spin chains. And on the other side, we have gauge theory. That in particular, I will be talking only about two-dimensional gauge theories. Um, so this was or or originally proposed for bosonic spin chains by Nekrasov Fratashvili and later uh, was, ex was extended to super spin chains uh, by Nekrasov. Um, so, as we're saying, on the beta side, we have a spin chain with G symmetry, where G in this case is GLM slash N. And uh, so the entities in that side are so a spin chain containing L spin sites. So these are all spin sites. Uh, each of them carry some representation of G and also are labeled by uh, complex numbers zeta. Uh, so these complex numbers are called in, in homogeneities. And so uh, um, the, the Hilbert space associated to the spin chain um, is just a tensor product of the representation spaces. Uh, as part of the data also includes um, an R matrix, which is a map from the tensor product of two representations to the same tensor product, uh, which comes from crossing two of the spin sites. Uh, with uh, different inhomogeneities. Or perhaps this is a representation of the universal order matrix, which is valid in terms of products of the universal enveloping algebra. And integrability is in, in this context equivalent to uh, satisfying certain equation called the yang baxter equation, which it's easy to write down <clears throat> in a graphical form, uh, which says that if we have, if we take any three spin sites, then uh, it doesn't really matter in which order we cross them. Or that is, so we can kind of smoothly move a line across an intersection and the map that this picture corresponds to, which is a map from the tensor product of these two representations to the same tensor product is the same map. Now, a consequence of this young baxter equation is the following. Okay, so we can define, so we can introduce an auxiliary spin site, which is, which has all the proper, same properties as the ordinary spin sites, uh, but it is something that crosses with all the sites uh, that were previously present. Uh, so this will define a map, so if you write down, So if I have something like this, B1, B2, and I introduce another auxiliary site with some representation U, then this defines a map with, uh, from the tensor product of U, and then all the tensor products of the original spins to the same tensor product. Uh, and then by Looping, I'm just 
I'm implying that I'm taking a trace over this U vector space. So that now this is a map. So this loop corresponds to a map from the tensor product of these vector spaces to the tensor product of these vector spaces. Um, now, a very important uh, consequence of the young vector equations is that if I introduce two such operators, then they commune for any arbitrary values of the spectral parameters or inhomogeneities that I would assign to these auxiliary sites. <clears throat> so, by so, so this L has nothing to do with this L. Uh, so this L refers to this operator that acts on this tensor product for H. Uh, and the point is that this, this operator converts with itself for arbitrary values of the spectral parameters, uh, which means that by expanding this operator in terms of the spectral parameter, uh, we get a bunch of commuting charges, which are the conserved charges for the spin chain. And we have enough conserved charges to justify calling this an integrable system. <clears throat> now, so we can label the states uh, in the space in terms of eigenstates of this operator. Um, now, an eigenstate will consist of a fixed number of excitations on the spin chain of certain types. Now, the types correspond to the simple roots of the Lie algebra, in this case, GLMN, I'm writing G for short. Um, so for each simple root, there's a type of excitation or a species of excitation. Uh, sorry, I have a very basic question at this point. Mm -hmm. So uh, for this spin chain, should I, is there a Hamiltonian or it doesn't matter? Uh, so you have a bunch of commuting charges that we get by uh, that are coming from this transfer matrix. Right. You can take any of them to be the Hamiltonian, but I think, so they get increasingly non-local as you consider higher powers of L. Uh, uh, yes. I think these are all completely non-local. What people do is ah. that there's a parameter okay. value where L degenerates and you expand around that parameter and the coefficients in the expansion are local. With, it depends on something okay. other than Yang-Baxter equation that you can make local Hamiltonians. I see, I see. Okay. So you can make local Hamiltonians. That's part of the miracle. But okay, okay, yeah. okay. Thank okay. you. I see. So sorry. So what does the local Hamiltonian look like? Well, you're familiar. Okay, I guess that. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Well, the most famous one is the Heisenberg spin chain okay. for three and a half particles. Okay. Yeah. We can get all kinds of more complicated ones. Okay. Uh, right. so as I was saying that each eigenstate of this transfer matrix, sorry, so this L operator is called the transfer matrix. Uh, so each eigenstate will consist of a fixed number of excitations of each type. Um, and each excitation will come with a complex parameter, which um, in the spin chain literature, I think is called a rapidity. Um, it's related to, I guess intuitively, the momentum associated to that excitation. Um, so my notation for the rapidities are Sigma, where which has two indices, one is one refers to the type of excitation, and the other a refers to all the excitations of that type. So an eigenstate will be labeled by a bunch of rapidities, um, where uh, the index m goes from one to r, where r is the rank of the algebra, or the number of simple roots. And uh, the other index enumerates the excitations of a given type. Now, a state will only be an eigenstate for certain values of sigma, not for all values. And the condition that a state be an eigenstate of the transfer matrix is that 
uh, these variables satisfy certain set of equations called the beta equations. Um, so I did not actually write down the beta equations. I mean, they're very nice, but it takes some time to extract enough interesting information out of them. So, so let, let me just mention that this is an equation where both sides are rational functions of all the parameters. Uh, so we, we solve the equations for this variable sigma, but the equations depend on all the parameters that uh, define this such a spin chain. Uh, they include the inhomogeneities, inhomogeneities associated to each spin site, <clears throat> the representations of the sites, uh, which we can label by the highest weights, um, and some twist parameter, which, so I'm considering closed spin chains, something like this, for example. Um, and the twist is something that uh, changes the periodicity on this closed spin chain. That is, uh, if I move excitation of certain type around, the, around uh, my closed spin chain, it comes back to itself up to some phase. And that is determined by uh, some complex number tau n. Oh. I have a question. Yes. So we, we will only consider high, high, sway, high sway modules? Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, only high speed modules and uh, even more specifically, only finite dimensional high speed modules. OK. Could you remind me what the set dyes are? Um, so. They are called inhomogeneities, and there, there are some complex numbers associated to spin each is spin side. Uh, I will have more to say about them in the context that I will be discussing the spin chain. Um, okay, fine. Uh, yeah, but um, I mean, so the spin chain literature goes back many, many years, and uh, they probably have their own interpretation of what these variables mean. But yeah, I will say more about this in the context that I will be discussing. Um, so that's one side of the correspondence. And on the other side of the correspondence, we have a two-dimensional gauge theory with n equals two comma two supersymmetry, um, defined by a quiver which comes from uh, the Dimkin diagram of the Lie algebra. Um, so since I'm considering GLMN, one of the possible Dimkin diagrams of GLMN is say, this picture, uh, which has a bunch of bosonic nodes that are these um, white circles. Uh, this should be n minus one, n minus one. Mm, and one, um, odd simple root. So each so each circle corresponds to a simple root of the of the algebra, and, and the black circle corresponds to an odd simple root of the algebra. Uh, so this is not a unique choice of Dinkin diagram, uh, but this is the most common choice. Um, so I will talk mostly about this particular choice of the Dinkin diagram, and I will say a few words about other choices at the end. Um, so starting from such a Dinkin diagram, uh, we can construct a two comma two gauge theory, uh, which is defined in the most concise way by a quiver diagram, such as this one. Uh, so, so let me make a few comments about what various parts of this diagram are. Uh, the circular nodes represent a gauge group. So the circle with N1 is a UN1 gauge group. Uh, so it has a bunch of, um, circular nodes, meaning that the gauge symmetry is a product of mm, all these individual gauge groups. Uh, the square nodes correspond to some flavor groups. So, um, and, and a directed edge between two nodes correspond to a chiral multiplet. And the, arrow, the direction of the arrow determines the representation, uh, whether it's fundamental or anti-fundamental with respect to this group and this group. So, uh, two different errors correspond to card multiplets that are in dual representations. Um, and the loop is an adjoint representation, is a card multiplet in the adjoint representation of this gauge group. 
Um, so all the bosonic nodes correspond to uh, something like this, which has the same matter content as a two comma two, same matter content as a two D theory with four comma four supersymmetry. Um, and the odd node corresponds to uh, something like this, which is necessarily a two comma two theory and does not have enough matter for the four comma four theory. Meaning that it's, it's missing a loop, uh, an adjoint scalar for an adjoint carrier multiple. And also it has uh, flavor symmetry that are chiral in the sense that uh, fundamental and then the fundamental matter transform under different flavor groups. <clears throat> so uh, these U UK factors correspond to uh, these flavor nodes. Uh, I should also include. So these are these nodes. And also very importantly, so, so it can have more, say you want flavor symmetries acting on various matter. Uh, but one of them is very special in the sense that, so we're going to use one of them to deform the theory by giving mass with respect to the symmetry. So there's a very special U1 symmetry, um, which we, we are going to use later on in addition to this flavor symmetry to make the theory completely massive. And so, so all the matter are charged under this particular U1 with various charges. Okay. Which one was U1 epsilon again? Sorry. Um, so this is a particular flavor symmetry of the theory under which all of the matter are charged. Um, um, uh, except, except these two. So we can construct this U1 from um, some U1 global symmetry coming from uh, these two uh, individual components of the quiver. Uh, it's a particular linear combination of some U and R symmetry coming from uh, these two different uh, components. Okay. Is there a different answer that you're looking for? I'm fine. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Did you say something? That's fine, thank you. Okay. So uh, so next, say, oh, sorry, uh, what do okay. Ni's and Mi's and L correspond to on the other side? And all this Ki, uh, oh sorry, what, yeah, what do Ni, Ki, and L mm -hmm. correspond to on the other side? So uh, I will actually make an, an exact correspondence between those two in a moment. Oh, okay, okay, thanks. Uh, so the next, uh, we're going to introduce the mass deformations to make all the matter uh, massive. So, uh, so this corresponds to turning on twisted masses for all the flavor symmetries. Um, then we integrate out all the matter. Uh, this generates um, a twisted zero potential for um, the adjoint scalar, the scalar in the vector multiplet of the two comma two theory. Um, so suppose this is one of the gauge nodes. Um, then the scalars in the vector multiplet corresponding to these gauge nodes. Uh, so I'm writing them as sigma, where M labels the gauge node and A goes from one to N M um, for the generators of the Cartan sub algebra. And for the abelian part of each gauge node, we can also turn on a complexified FI parameter. Um, which is a linear combination, complex linear combination of the real FI parameter and the theta parameter, the theta angle. And we break each flavor node by introducing um, L um, twisted masses. So the breaking is that, so UKM breaks down into L distinct factors with various ranks. And <clears throat> the, the chiral, flavor symmetry that I had here. Uh, so 
I break this by again introducing twist masses down to the maximal level in torus. Okay. Uh, so suppose that this generates a twister superpotential W of sigma. Uh, so so I'm, I'm thinking of this as a function of sigma, but of course it depends on all the masses that I have introduced. So in particular, uh, the masses that are used to break the flavor symmetries. Um, the ranks that I have after the symmetry is broken. So here I have written the ranks in a way um, that can easily correspond to weights of GLMN. Um, so I have arranged, uh, so starting from K1, M minus one, and then uh, these two masses, and then M plus one to M, M plus N minus one. So these Ks correspond to Dinkin label associated to the bosonic simple roots of GLMN. And this A plus minus is, are related to the odd Dinkin label. Uh, in particular, the sum is the odd Dinkin label. And the other linear combination will appear when I try to compute the overall central charge. <clears throat> and I have L of such sets. Um, in addition to that, I also had the FA parameters. So, so since once I have the superpotential, I can try to find the extrema of the superpotential, which is given by some equation that looks like this, which is just a, this is a, this, the variation vanishes. Now, the, the remarkable thing is that this equation uh, is identical to Uh, the method equations that determined the values of the rapidities that labeled eigenstates of the transfer matrix. And now, now to answer the question that Sharon asked about what is the matching of the parameters, I'm, I'm already using the same letters. That is, well, okay, not perhaps all the time. Uh, so here I just said that uh, these method equations depend on the highest weights of the representations associated to the spin sites. Uh, those highest weights are precisely these integers. So which are the ranks of the flavor group after the breaking of the flavor symmetry. Um, then, so in the gauge theory side, I also had Ni. So which are the ranks of the gauge groups. Um, so, so they do not appear in the definition of the spin, spin system. But as I was saying that each, um, each eigenstate is labeled by a fixed number of excitations of different types. So in particular, so here I have the number of excitations of a given type M um, and these correspond to uh, the ranks of the gauge groups. Except, um, so I think the only thing missing now is uh, this continuous parameter. Well, no, no. Yeah, so this is a complete match. I mean, right. So this is part of the highest weight. Right. Okay. Um, so for representation of G elementary the highest weight, uh, we only require these Ks to be um, non-negative integers. And uh, these two parameters can be arbitrary complex numbers. Hi, Nifty's. Uh, Sorry, the zetas on the gauge theory side were associated to the U1 uh, to. Sorry, I. Uh, got... uh, to the breaking of these flavor groups. Associated to the breaking of the flavor groups. Okay. And if I were just an integrable systems person, I, I know there's some complex numbers that you attach to a representation, but is there any other way I should think of them um, from the spin chain point of view? I guess they're associated to uh, the R matrix, like R is a function of the difference of the zetas. So, so one thing I can say is that, so from the spin chain perspective, um, the representations are really representations of the Youngian, yeah, because the symmetry of the integral system is the Youngian. And um, the, G, the GLM representations are related to representations of the Youngian by an evaluation map. And the, the evaluation map, involves 
evaluating a particular parameter, the value of which in this case is zeta. But okay, so that's not a very spin chainy answer, I guess. Actually, I'm not 100% sure what the spin chain people would define the zeta as. I mean, without referring to representation theory, just in terms of spin chain. Uh, perhaps someone else know a better answer. But... I have a question. So could you remind us why the equations involve the exponential of the derivative and not just the derivative of the, of the superpotential equal to uh, Oh, no, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, um, yeah, why, why isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we could say- W equal to, just remind, yeah, what? I mean, why? I mean, you're saying that we could just say this is zero? The condition is that dw tilde d sigma is equal to zero. But yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the only reason for writing this is that the, the equation looks, so um, this derivative will involve a bunch of logarithms. So we can write down an, an equation involving logarithms and saying that this is valid to zero or some integral multiple of two pi. Uh, but I mean, if we just take the exponential, the logarithms go away and we, we are just left with a rational okay, okay. equation in the rational expressions. Right. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm forgetful, but I thought what happens is that there are fluxes that can be shifted by two yes. pi. So all branches of logarithms are physical. In other words, okay. I think writing what you've written is a quick way to express everything in terms of sigma without worrying about some integers, which are gauge theory fluxes. Uh, right, so, no, so, uh, so I think what you're referring to is that, yeah, so I, I'm taking some liberty in the fact that I can shift. No, it's as you said, the, the supernatural is multi, twisted supernatural is multi-valued, but solutions in all branches are meaningful. And right. taking the exponential is a quick way to say, to include solutions on any branch. Yes, yes, yes. okay. Uh, but, but it's equivalent to saying that, I mean, if I if I just had the multivalue function, then I could set it to any integral multiple of two pi, right? Yeah, but as opposed to just zero. Okay. If you yes, so, value equation, you'd need to sp to specify that all branch solutions on any branch are considered valid. Yes. Yes. I mean. So just a comment is that, um, so on the spin side, on the spin chain side, um, well, just a comment, not, not much to it. It's just that the beta equations can also be written as uh, exp derivative of a certain function with respect to the rapidities to be one. Um, so this is some potential type function that that gives us all the better equations and the matching can be made at the level of these potential functions, uh, which in the spin, spin chain side is referred to as a young, young potential and uh, which, which happens to be uh, the two sets of a potential generated in the gauge theory setting. So, uh, so that was a review of the better gauge correspondence. Uh, is there any question? Um, <clears throat> so what is the role of the four-digit Simon series? Um, so let me first introduce the four-digit Simon series. Um, this is a kind of a 4D analog of the perhaps more familiar 3 digit Simon series. Um, we can write down an action for it, which looks like um, an integration over a four-dimensional space-time, which um, is the product of some two-dimensional space times some Riemann surface, or um, and here I have the ordinary Simon Simon's tree form, where A is just the connection for a complex gauge group. Um, and omega is a holomorphic volume form 
defined on the Riemann surface. Um, so uh, as so the this actual kind of explicitly depends on the complex structure of the Riemann surface. Um, there are very subtle trees associated with this 4D transformer theory. Um, I will not have much to say about them. So for example, uh, this is necessarily a complex valid action. Uh, but then again, this the path integration is defined as an analytic continuity. This is defined as an analytically continued theory. That is, you choose certain contours to make sense of the exponential, exponential of this action. Um, <clears throat> This theory has some very nice connection and some very intuitive connections to spin chains, which was pointed out in great detail by uh, Stolo, Witten, and Yamazaki. Um, uh, so I, I will review briefly some of the properties. The theory is topological on sigma and holomorphic on the Riemann surface. And we can create a spin chain inside this for this turn Simon theory uh, using line operators. So suppose that we have a bunch of line operators that are parallel to this topological surface. So, th so they're lines inside sigma uh, carrying some representations of whatever our gauge group is. And uh, they're located at certain points in the holomorphic direction. Uh, so, so this line is located at this point. Now, um, so we can compute the expectation values of such a system in particular. So we can take crossing of line operators. So we can provide some incoming and outgoing states and compute the expectation value. That will give us some matrix element of the R matrix. And the fact that this here is topological on sigma mm -hmm. allows us to move a line from one position to the other. And as long as uh, these lines are located at different points in the holomorphic direction, uh, there is never really any intersection between anything. So uh, we can kind of see that these defines the same map from the tensor product of these vector spaces to the same tensor product as this. We have just changed the position of, of a line in the topological plane. And we have a topological invariant theory. <clears throat> and this is graphically the same as our young baxter equation. So, so this is kind of the uh, underlying basic fact that leads to uh, the connection between integral spin chains and the 4D and Simon series. Now, the, the main point of my talk is that uh, we can construct this 4D and Simon series using certain brain configurations in string theory. Um, and we can also construct a spin chain using line operators by intersecting certain brains again. Yeah. And then we can look at uh, the ground states of that setup, which will correspond to the states in the representation of the spin chain symmetry. And then we can apply string duality to our brain configurations to go to a different string frame and consider the space of vacuum in that frame. And we should have a one-to-one -one match. And the claim is that that match is the same as the beta gauge correspondence. When does the talk end? Uh, it's one hour, so you still have about 25 minutes. Okay. Yeah. All right, so uh, let me now explain how we go about creating a 40 turn Simon theory from brains uh, for the gauge group GLM slash M. <clears throat> so uh, we start in type 2B. And we take our space time to be dimensional space time to be the Riemann surface at 
times the cotangent bundle of the topological surface uh, times tau knot. Um, and so there is an exact B field and some constant dilaton and nothing else. <clears throat> then we include MD5 brains wrapping C times sigma and a cigar inside the top knot and ND5 brains uh, wrapping C times sigma and a different cigar inside the top knot. Uh, maybe I should say a few things about what the cigars and the top knots are. So the a top knot can be visualized mm -hmm. as kind of like a bouquet of cigars where there's a two sphere which parameterizes the different cigars. Um, and so I'm choosing two particular cigars. I'm just calling them cigar plus and minus. And I'm wrapping uh, the D5 brains along. I'm wrapping two different stacks of D5 brains on two different cigars. And just as a reference, if I T dualize the top net circle, then this setup is uh, dual to an NS5 brain. And so the top node becomes an SI brain and the D5 brains become D4 brains. And I have two different stacks of D4 brains ending on the NS5 brains coming from opposite sides. Actually, a further comment is that, <clears throat> so I can T-dualize, uh, I can make a further T-duality, which is parallel to the NS5 brains, but um, parallel to both NS5 and D4s. So, so NS5 remains NS5, but the D4s become D3s. So I have an NS5 and two different stacks of D3 brains ending on the NS5 brain. And uh, this type of setup was used by Mikhailov and Witten to define uh, a three-day term Simon theory with super Lie group. So this is a theory that leaves The gauge fields coming from both sides, if I restrict them to here, so there are also strings attached to different stacks, uh, and they all combine to form a super connection. Uh, but, but okay, so back to our. Symmetry? Uh, I'm sorry? Is your U1 epsilon symmetry come from the Taub knot geometry? Yes. Uh, yeah, so I will mention it again. <clears throat> Okay, so, so in my setup, uh, this configuration preserves a supercharge that I can use to do to, to define a supersymmetric twist. And in particular, uh, that twist will lead us to a UN six J gauge theory or a topological holomorphic twist of six J equals one comma one super young mills with U1 gauge group on one cigar and with UM gauge group on the other cigar. And the topological holomorphic refers to so this theory is topological on sigma and holomorphic on C times the cigar. Um, and there are strings connecting the two cigars, which so the dual two string connecting the two stacks of D4s in this case. And so those are restricted only he, here. So which is a four dimensional intersection. And the twist renders this four dimensional theory into the Kaposian twist of 4D n equals two theory. Uh, of hypermultiplets with U M times U M uh, symmetry coming from U M on one side and U N on the other side. Uh, now, we want to apply an omega deformation to this system and reduce, effectively reduce the dimensions. Uh, so, so omega deformation allows us to work kind of equivalently with respect to some U1 rotations associated to space-time space -time symmetries, um, which gives us a description of certain protective subsectors of the theory in terms of an effective theory which essentially lives in a lower dimension, um, uh, which is a goal here that we want to reduce this 6G theory, this twisted 6G theory to a four-dimensional theory, uh, which will eventually be the 4 and Simon theory that we want. <clears throat> Uh, the omega deformation was introduced uh, by Nekrasov and started further by Nekrasov Witten and also probably many other people. So, uh, by the way, so there's a vast literature about these and related subjects. 
uh, I must say that I'm not perhaps as familiar with them as I should be. So if, if I'm missing an important reference, uh, I will be very happy to know. Okay. <clears throat> so one kind of brainy way to introduce Omega deformation is that we deform this ordinary product of the Riemann surface and the Taubner into a twisted product, meaning that so I can view the Taubner as being non-trivially fibered over the uh, Riemann surface uh, such that if I go around one, go around the cycle of the surface, uh, the Taubner circle is rotated by some angle epsilon one, let's say. And if I go around the other circle, uh, it's rotated by say epsilon two. Uh, and I can introduce a complex linear combination of epsilon one and epsilon two. This is not exact, uh, meaning that the complex linear combination will depend on the complex structure on, on the Riemann surface, but essentially it's something like this. Um, so a side comment is that if I um, t-dualize one of these one cycles, then I reach a particular background, uh, which was already studied uh, by Hellerman, Orlander, and Riffer. Uh, they called it a Taub trap background. They, they also had something called a flux trap background, which involved not the Taub but just flat R4. Um, this is kind of a Taub version of that. Okay, so for our purposes, we kidualize the entire Riemann surface C, and we end up with a dual Riemann surface, K star sigma, and Taub And our D5 brains have now become D3 brains, uh, wrapping uh, just sigma and the cigar. Um, so this is kind of an A-type omega deformation, meaning that the surgery will look like, from the vantage point of the cigars, this will look like a deformation of the A-twist of, uh, of a 2 comma 2 theory. Um, but we want to use a B-type omega deformation. That is something that looks like a deformation of the B-twist of a 2 comma 2 theory. Um, so we can apply S-duality, which changes the A-type omega deformation to the B-type omega deformation. And then if we t-dualize back on the dual Riemann surface, Riemann surface, we are now in a situation where we have, again, D5 plus minus brains, wrapping C times sigma times cigar. The extra thing is that we now have a B-type omega deformation on cigar, and also some non-trivial background fields, uh, a dilaton and Ramon Ramon Tupon. And and the reason that we went through this process to introduce omega deformation is that um, we can use some existing computations about how to reduce this uh, B-type omega deformed topological holomorphic 6D theory. Um, and okay, so this is essentially the same picture as before. I'm just saying that now we have, a, have an omega deformation that rotates the uh, Taubner circle. So this effectively reduces the SFG theory to a 40 theory uh, localized on C times sigma. And uh, this theory is mm, exactly the 40 turn Simon theory with GLM and gauge group. <clears throat> so, so in the process of uh, localization by omega deformation, our gauge group was complexified from U to GL. Um, um, a bosonic counterpart of this computation was carried out by Costello and Yagi. Um, so they constructed 40 turn simons with just GL gauge, GL M gauge group by essentially a very similar, similar process. So what happens in the super case is that uh, the two 40 turn simon series with GLM and GLM gauge group provides us with two connections and uh, the Kapustian theory that lived at the intersection of these two theories uh, provides us with some fermionic fields uh, that now combine together to form a super connection. Uh, there are more fields in the, in the Kapustian theory, for example, and the remaining fields fit nicely into a BRST complex for the gauge theory. <clears throat> uh, were there any questions? Right. 
Um, so now that we have the four different semi series, uh, we want to introduce line operators, um, in particular, boson lines. And so we can do that by introducing more brains, in particular, DC brains. Um, we want them to be line operators uh, on the topological plane. So they wrap some line inside sigma. Uh, they also wrap the cigars and they extend in the directions normal to the topological plane. Uh, so some diagrams for them would be something like this. So we have the D5 plus and D5 minus frames, uh, D3 minus and D3 pluses. And then we can uh, suspend fundamental strings between them. And the word line of these fundamental strings, which are lines inside this support of the 40 Karen Simon theory, will become the Wilson lines in the 40 Karen Simons after the Omega deformation. <clears throat> and I should point out that this computation of introducing Wilson lines by intersecting D5s and D3s uh, is very similar to uh, some computation done by Gomez and Passerini, uh, who were. I mean, their interest was different. They were interested in creating line operators in 4 equals 4 theories to study their ADS dual. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so now one important point is that different configurations of fundamental strings correspond to different states in, in the certain representation. So a representation is fixed by how many DT brains I have and how many fundamental strings are attached to that DT brain. And different states in the same representation are found by different uh, fun configurations of fundamental strings given the initial constraint, which is that say this string could end somewhere here or there are many different configurations uh, of fundamental strings that I can create and they will correspond to different states in the same representation. Just as an example, so this will create some state in this representation. Um, so this is a young diagram for superly algebra. Uh, just some diagrammatic way to represent uh, highest weights. So the shape represents highest weights. And again, with some elaborate rules, I can fill this up with numbers and they will correspond to uh, states in the representation. And one nice thing about this brain construction is that associated to each brain configuration, I can assign a diagram with numbers filled in. <clears throat> uh, so one comment is that in order to get a full representation, I have to consider different, many different configurations of fundamental strings, which is fine because of course, fundamental strings are dynamical and we should really sum over them. Uh, so these DC brains should be coincident for them to correspond to a single representation or a single screen size. Uh, I'm just separating them for convenience. All right. Um, so now we can apply some string dualities to go to a different frame where instead of these fundamental strings, we will have something that will lead us to a 2 gauge theory in particular. So we can start by applying S duality, uh, which will turn the D5s to NS5s the fundamental strings to D1 strings or D1 brains. And then we can apply a T duality that's transverse to the D1 brains but parallel to the topological surface sigma. Uh, so ultimately we will end up with some configuration that looks like this. Uh, oh, so, a, a so this is not really dual to this configuration. I copied the picture from somewhere else. Uh, it's just a sample that we will have some NS5 brains NS5 plus, NS5 minuses, and with D4 plus and D4 minuses, and some D2 brains suspended between them. Um, I mean, if I start directly from here, I will end up with some configuration where uh, all the D4 brains will be at the two ends, for example, but then I, I can apply the Harnovit transitions to bring the D4 brains inside such that there aren't any D2 suspended between D4s and NS5s, but all the D2s are now suspended between the NS5s. Um, and this is the kind of configuration that leads us to a quiver uh, theory with Chukma 2 supersymmetry in two dimensions. Uh, so here, these two NS5s are really parallel and um, the D2 suspended between them have 
four real directions or two complex directions to fluctuate. Um, so one of them will be the complex, complex scalar in the two-commutative vector multiplet, and the other one will be a complex scalar in the adjoint chiral multiplet in the two-commutative language, or in a four-commutative language, all of them will be in the same vector multiplet. Um, so the only difference is that here, when I go from minus five to minus five plus to minus five minus, uh, they only share two real directions. And so the complex scalar coming from fluctuations in those two directions enter into the vector multiplet, and we don't have anything that can create an adjoint scalar. Um, so I mentioned symmetry breaking um, in order to make the theory entirely massive. Um, <clears throat> so symmetry breaking, okay. So flavor symmetries of discrete theory are coming from these D4 brains. So the ranks of these flavor groups will directly correspond to the number of the D4 brains. So let's look at a particular node. Suppose this is the M minus five and this is the M plus one minus five. And in between them, I have KM uh, D4 brains so that I'm starting from a UKM flavor symmetry. And um, by breaking the symmetry by twisted masses, in particular L twisted masses, I'm separating these D4 brains in this particular way. So I clump them, so I make L distinct clumps of D4 brains located at zeta one, zeta two, uh, dot, 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 zeta L. So they share the same position, but positions of different bunches of D4s are different. And this each bunch has say K1, K2, et cetera, uh, number of D4 brains. Uh, so this is what's going on. And this is what I wrote down earlier. Um, okay, so, so in this picture, uh, the, the inhomogeneities are locations of the different brains in the holomorphic direction, or in in, an, in some earlier picture, the inhomogeneities would be so locations of uh, these line operators in four different simons in the in the holomorphic direction. <clears throat> All right, so these integer integer numbers, uh, they really capture the bosonic Dinkin labels. Uh, but what about the uh, continuous Dinkin labels? I mean, they cannot possibly be ranks of gauge groups. Uh, so related to these questions, there are several questions that I don't fully understand yet. Uh, so let me say what I found. Uh, so in, in addition to the different brains that I mentioned earlier, I can also introduce semi-infinite D4 brains. Well, so in this case, I'm in a duality frame where I have D2 brains. So, so that's before this duality, just here. Um, so these are the NS5s as before, but now on each NS5, I am, I am ending a semi-infinite D3 brains, which extends to infinity one in only in one direction. Uh, now, okay, so what is the reason for that? Um, so the continuous labels uh, for a GLM representation uh, came from the chiral flavor symmetry. associated to the middle node. And so we can introduce chiral flavor symmetry via the semi-infinite uh, D brains. Okay, so, so here I have um, D1 brains. I probably should have drawn, okay, should have written D4 so that this would correspond to the theory, by the way. Anyway, um, right, so here, uh, the strings joining these D D1s and the semi-infinite D3s uh, give us only half of, only a chiral, only a fundamental chiral multiplet and not the anti-fundamental. And the strings coming from this semi-infinite D3 and ending on these D1s, they give us the anti-fundamental uh, chiral multiplet. And their masses are determined by this separation. 
So now we can give the fundamental and the fundamental current multiples different masses by separating these two brains differently. Uh, so, so while this gives the chiral flavor symmetry at the odd node, this introduces some more complications because now I have also strings attached to this semi-infinite brain and the D ones on the adjacent node. And this will give us a matter multiple that we didn't have before. And we, we don't really want their contribution to our Bethe equation because they do not correspond to anything coming from the spin chain side. Uh, well, so this picture is kind of looking at this from this point of view, so that these are the semi-infinite brains. And I'm just highlighting that uh, the separation of the D1s and uh, the semi-infinite D3 brains are really the plus and the minuses uh, that give us the continuous labels. And to remedy the problem that I mentioned, I just mentioned that we get some extra multi matter content that we don't really want. So uh, we can cancel their contributions to the vacuum equation of the 2D3 by tuning their location in the holomorphic direction. So as long as these brains are separated by epsilon, where epsilon was the omega deformation parameter kept, that came from um, the twisted product of top node and the Riemann surface. Uh, so, so as long as these brains are separated by epsilon consecutively, their contributions to the beta equation can cancel out and they don't contribute anything to the bosonic nodes. So we are only left with uh, the contribution at the fermionic node. Um, okay, uh, but so this complicates the quiver. I mean, the quiver looks significantly more complex than it did before. Uh, so we have, okay, well, so, okay, so this is for one spin side, but if we want to introduce the continuous label at one spin side, if you want to introduce continuous labels at each, at each spin side, um, we need as many semi infinite digital brains on each NS5s as there are spin sides, so in particular L. So this introduces some L flavor symmetry, some chiral flavor symmetry uh, in between each node. And, but as I was saying before that the breaking of the symmetries will have to be, the twisted masses that are used to break the symmetries will have to be tuned in a very particular way so that I don't get any extra contribution coming from this thing. That is, I want the contribution of this, this multiplet to cancel the contribution of this multiplet. Um, so this type of quiver, well, at least half this, at least this part of the quiver, um, as far as I understand is well studied. And sometimes people refer to them as a hand saw type quiver. And uh, they were studied by, uh, in the mass literature, Nakajima Finkelberg, Rybnikov, and in the physical literature by Bulimur, Dimovte, Gaito, Hilborn, and Kim. Uh, so, uh, I cannot say much about the math literature, unfortunately, uh, but the physics people were interested in um, the Coulomb branch algebra of some 3D theories. So uh, in particular, we can see where the 3D theories are coming from. Uh, they're the theories that live at the end, end of at the boundary of this G2 brains. So in particular, if I look at this picture from kind of the sideways, uh, I will see things like these, where these are D3s, these are NS5s. Uh, um, so, yeah, so th this term is a 3D quiver theory and will couple to a 4D bulk. Uh, and in, in some previous picture, when I was drawing the D1 brains, the things that are dual to these things, the D1 brains, or in this case, these things. So they will appear as um, vortices in this 3D theory, in, in the current branch of the 3D theory. And so they were really interested in the algebra of monopole operators or the, the current branch algebra of the 3D theories and um, th this kind of quiver, I guess was an interesting example to study. <clears throat> All right. Uh, okay. So, so some important thing that I don't understand yet is that it seems like um, this kind of construction should allow us to consider not only 
continuous labels at the odd, odd simple root, but also continuous labels at the bosonic simple roots, uh, which would lead us to uh, infinite dimensional highest root representations. Uh, but I have not uh, figured out how that works yet. Uh, I guess I'm almost at the end of my time, but so, so let me, I, I don't have much left. So let me make some uh, quick comments about uh, some problems that can be considered in the setup. So, so far, what I have described is kind of like a setup in which we can treat various problems. So for example, we can look at the Higgs bunch of the 2D theory. Uh, if we turn on generic FA parameters, uh, then um, the, the theory goes to the Higgs bunch vacua. Uh, and with mass deformations, the, the Higgs bunch is almost entirely lifted, except some discrete vacua. And this discrete vector should correspond to um, the states in the representations or via the via this beta gauge correspondence. Uh, so suppose we have some theory X and, and the Higgs branch vector of this theory X um, is given by uh, the equivalent cohomology of the Higgs branch uh, where the equivariant with respect to um, all the twisted masses that we turn on. So in particular, the curtain of the flavor symmetry and this all important U1 symmetry that we have. Um, now, the spin chain symmetry algebra. Uh, so, so as, as I mentioned earlier, that we get all the states in the representation by considering different configurations of fundamental strings. Uh, so, the creation and annihilation, the action of creation and annihilation operators in these representations correspond to creating and annihilating fundamental strings or extending or retracting them. Uh, in the dual frame, they correspond to creating and annihilating D2 brains. Um, so the, the, the point, he, point here is that the spin chain symmetry algebra involves creation and, and annihilation of brains. So for example, if I look at a particular node uh, and some Chevrolet generators, then the action of the uh, creation operator corresponds to creating some segments of D2 brains. And so what this means is that under the action of the symmetry algebra, uh, some Higgs branch vector of one theory will be mapped to some Higgs branch vector of, of different theory. I mean, they have the same rank, but um, there will be multiple vector in general. Uh, so um, considering the action of the Youngian on the spin chain spectrum, we should expect an action of the Youngian on the direct sum of the equivalent cohomologies of uh, all the 2D theories. So this is sum over 2D theories that are dual to the entire spin spectrum. Uh, the bosonic case is well known. Uh, this was started in the math literature by Molly Kokonkov, Aganaji Kokonkov, and mm, this was highlighted from the physical point of view by Bullimore, Hitchell, Kim, and Lukowski. <clears throat> so in the bosonic case, all the hedge branches are hypercalar. Uh, but we should also expect something similar for the super spin chain case, uh, where some of the Higgs branches are not hypercalar, but just scalar. And I don't know uh, a realization of this. Uh, the last comment is that uh, in terms of brains, we can do various manipulations that shouldn't change the IR physics. In, for example, we can do some Harnovitian transitions. Um, just as an, as an example, uh, suppose I have some minus five, uh, minus five two, two different types of minus fives but I can change their ordering, uh, such as uh, something like this. Uh, so here, uh, this was a bosonic node. This was a fermionic node. This was a bosonic node. Uh, here, they're all fermionic nodes. Uh, so manipulations of brains in the ultraviolet that shouldn't change the IR physics should lead to some dualities of the spin chains uh, as well. Uh, so these kind of dualities are known in the spin chain literature. Um, I think they're called fermionic dualities for super spin chains. Um, yes, yeah, so, so this dictionary between brain manipulations and spin chain dualities also need to be made a bit more precise than it currently is. And slightly over time. So let me end here and thank you all for listening to the talk. All right, thank you. Thank you Nafis for the nice talk. Uh, any other questions?
Uh, may I ask a question, please? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for the talk. That was really nice. And uh, two questions, actually. I wanted to understand this uh, topological invariance uh, that you defined mm -hmm. for uh, the particular uh, uh, manifolds. You had uh, an elliptic curve with uh, the zeta mm -hmm. mark on it, and then there were these line defects. Yes. So what is going on is that if I braid the points on the, the elliptic curve, or if I move these zetas around each other, uh, mm -hmm. the the three line defects basically give a non-trivial uh, link or a braid in the in the complete four manifold then so because if you go a little bit further down i think that's what your uh, this thing yeah oh uh, sorry uh here yeah so these two equivalences is basically saying uh, Zeta i going around zeta k is the same as zeta k going around zeta i. But are you referring to braiding in the sense of knots in three dimension? Because yeah. we are in four, but I mean, in four dimension, we cannot braid, right? No, so the, the braiding is really going on in three, because you've separated the four dimensional manifold into these two things. And the mm -hmm. points that are moving are just fixed to the two-dimensional thing. These yeah. are somehow braids that live precisely in uh, sigma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyways, and the other question was about the uh, this uh, path integral for uh, 4D churn Simons. I just want to, uh, I mean, if I want to compute the... Uh, the propagator associated with this uh, path integral. Um, I can't do the normal thing. I mean, so, so the Lagrangian you've given exactly, and then I have to compute the Lagrangian from point A to point B, and then do the integral over all possible paths that go from point A to point B. Not all possible paths. It's m more like uh, a contrary integration in an infinite dimensional space. So we should think of e to the e to the power action of the four digit Simons as a holomorphic function of fields in the space of all fields. So you would take some middle dimensional cycle that goes from one point to the other. I see. Okay, so that's uh, different from the standard path integral. I mean, you have to integrate specifically over these middle dimensional cycles. Yes. And yes. where do these middle dimensional cycles come from? Uh, yeah, so the choice of the mirror dimensional cycles is, is it's a choice that has to be made when you're doing the omega deformation. So omega deformation is essentially re you're reducing a plane. I mean, if you have an omega deformation with respect to rotation on a plane, you're essentially reducing the plane to a point. Uh, but you have to make a choice of vacuum of the original theory at the infinity of the planes. And that choice will determine a particular contour for you. I see. That, okay, so that uh, this omega deformation cuts out the particular contour uh, that you need. Are these known in some explicit yes. example or some simple example? Uh, yes. Um, uh, for quantum, I mean, for some very detailed exp exp exposition of this, and in case of quantum mechanics, I think is a paper by Witten called Analytic Continuity. A new new look at path integration for quantum mechanics. And then this was applied um, for the path integration. Uh, the analytic continuation of 3D and Simon series and its relations to knot invariants. And then um, in the paper, five grains by knot, it was, I think it was also studied. Okay. And this is also related to more series in some sense that starting from a vacuum and treating your e to the power, your action as a Morse function, you can create the contour where you ensure that at the infinity of the contour, it decays enough so that the action doesn't, the path integration doesn't diverge. Okay, great, thanks. I mean, I would have to look into greater mm -hmm. detail because, okay. thank you. Sure. Uh, so how, how is the Mondrian matrix con constructed in the 4D science language? Some some correlation function of Wilson lines. Yes. So is it ex explicitly computable? Yes. 
I mean, yeah, you can come to explicit data matrix. Yeah, so. And how about how about the wave function, or uh, I should say beta vector. Uh, I see. Mm. I can't say that I remember an explicit computation. So, so let me not, let me not answer it because I don't remember it, if I can find it right now. But I'm not sure that it has not been done for the bosonic case. That is. Okay. Thanks. I think may I ask a question? So I think I was a bit lost in. So you had a quiver, you had a, a two D, mm -hmm. a two D gauge theory, right? That you construct yes. out yes. of frames. Yes. And was the four D Chern Simon theory also living on some brain or not? Yes. Uh, let me start. So I started with some six dimensional theory that were living on this product of a Riemann surface, some 2D surface and cigar. And then I essentially turned on an omega deformation that rotates each cigar around, uh, around the circle of the cigar. So, oh, okay, so like okay. This. So this was this, okay, fine. And then it localized to C times sigma. Okay, yeah. And how did you get the, the super group? I mean, normally D brains have a group. Uh, Yes, that's right. Um, so what happened is that, so on each cigar or on each stack of cigar, I, I got a 4D turn Simons. I mean, from each stack, I got a 4D turn Simons with complexified UN group or so GLN group. Uh, but at the intersection, I had um, gauge groups for both the GLN turn Simons and the GLN turn Simons. In addition to that, I, I also had a bunch of matter fields that came from uh, the strings that were suspended between the two stacks of uh, D5s. So uh, what ended up happening was that uh, the connection from the U for the GLM turn Simons and the connection for the GLN turn Simons, uh, they became the diagonal mm -hmm. bosonic component of a super connection. And, and the off diagonal fermionic parts came from the theory that lived at the intersection. So this was some, um, Capacitor twist of 4D equals 2 theories. It had a bunch of fermions that transform under by fundamental representations. And they fit together with the connections coming from the churn, churn, bosonic churn simons to make a super connection. I see. So the, the fact that you, you, you started with a six dimensional theory, but because you did this omega deformation, the gauge field really, the dynamical gauge field lives only at the origin. Yeah. And, and you yes. then combine with this other. Um, yes. At least in one dimension, last the fermions off diagonal come from hypermultiplets that live where the two stacks of brains meet. Yes. And then what, fermions have spin a half, but in the twisted theory, some components have spin one. And That's right, yes. It's a little non obvious, but modulo bears the exact stuff. You get this yes. transformance of this group. I imagine yes, I, I forgot to mention, I should have that. Yeah, so, so these, are, these become one from in the twisted theory, and just like. The connection and they're not spinners anymore. They're still fermions. They're still yes, fermions. They're in half. Yes, yes. Oh, I see. So the, the point is that the, this, this group did not arise from an ordinary gauge group before you do the twisting or in the fit or, or no. Ferencian theory. <clears throat> no. no. All right, any more question? All right, if not, let's thank uh, Nafis again. Thank you.